Okay, guys, so today we are going to start chapter five. So everybody should be, I think it's page 40 for everyone. So open up your book to page 40. You are going to, I'm going to read aloud to you just like I would in class. And I'm going to stop and ask the substitute or our guest teacher to um, ask you some comprehension questions as we go along. Like I'll pose the question and then I'll ask the guest teacher to pause the video so that you guys have time to discuss amongst yourselves as well as with the guest teacher before we move on. So um, let's get started. Page 40, chapter five. So I'm gonna begin there. And remember, if you have your own copy, I want you guys to be annotating. So highlight anything that is important, underlined if you don't have a highlighter. Um, write a note as to why you highlighted or underlined it because when you go back to look at that to answer a constructed response question on Friday, you might ask yourself, why in the world did I even see that as important? So remember, when we talk about annotating, anything that we read, whether it's a textbook or a novel, whether it's in English or in science or in social studies, it doesn't matter. Um, just underlining or highlighting is just the first step, okay? So be sure to take that one step further with a note, even if you go back and do it later, because sometimes that's what we need to do because it's hard to do the multitasking. So let's get started. His eyes snapped open hammered open, and there were these things about himself that he knew instantly. He was unbelievably, viciously thirsty. His mouth was dry and tasted foul and sticky. His lips were cracked and felt as if they were bleeding, and if he did not drink some water soon, he felt that he would wither up and die. Lots of water. All the water he could find. He knew the thirst and felt the burn on his face. It was mid-afternoon and the sun had come over him and cooked him while he slept and his face was on fire, would blister, would peel, which did not help the thirst, made it much worse. He stood using the tree to pull himself up because there was still some pain and much stiffness and looked down at the lake. It was water, but he did not know if he could drink it. Nobody had ever told him if you could or could not drink lakes. There was also the thought of the pilot down in the blue of the plane, strapped in the body. Awful, he thought. But the lake was blue and wet looking and his mouth and throat raged with the thirst and he did not know where there might be another form of water he could drink. Besides, he had probably swallowed a ton of it while he was swimming out of the plane and getting to shore. In the movies, they always showed the hero finding a clear spring with pure sweet water to drink, but in the movies, they did not have plane wrecks and swollen foreheads and aching bodies and thirst that tore at the hero until he couldn't think. Brian took small steps down the bank to the lake. Along the edge, there were thick grasses, and the water looked a little murky, and there were things, small things, swimming in the water, small bugs but there was a log extending about 20 feet out into the water of the lake, a beaver drop from some time before with old limbs sticking up almost like handles. He balanced on the log, holding himself up with the limbs and teetered out past the weeds and murky water. When he was out where the water was clear and he could see no bugs swimming, he kneeled on the log to drink. A sip, he thought, still worrying about the lake water. I'll just take a sip. But when he brought a cupped hand to his mouth and felt the cold lake water trickle past his cracked lips and over his tongue, he could not stop. He had never, not even on long bike trips in the hot summer, been this thirsty. It was as if the water were more than water, as if the water had become all of life and he could not stop. He stooped and put his mouth to the lake and drank and drank, pulling it deep and swallowing great gulps of it. He drank until his stomach was swollen, until he nearly fell off the log with it. Then he rose and stagger tripped his way back to the bank, where he was immediately sick and threw up most of the water. But his thirst was gone, and the water seemed to reduce the pain in his head as well, although the sunburn still cooked his face. So I'm going to stop right there and ask the substitute to uh, help you guys understand or see if you understand yet the reason for um, 
this extreme thirst that is leading to the headache and the reason why when he drinks the water, the headache sort of subsides a little. So what physically is happening to his body at this point? I'm going to give you just a minute to discuss that and get to the answer and then we'll continue reading. Okay, so hopefully through your discussion, you have found that this is a kid who's dehydrated. When subjected to the elements, he cooked in the sun. So like, I get we're in the Canadian wilderness, I get there's trees and forests, but where he was at was in direct sunlight and he essentially passed out after the plane crash. So he didn't get himself to any sort of shelter um, or any sort of safety. And so he's extremely dehydrated from having been exposed to the elements, exposed to the sun and not having any clean drinking water. So when he gets that water in his system, it helps the headache subside a little bit because dehydration causes a headache. So let's continue. So he almost jumped with the word spoken aloud. It seemed so out of place, the sound. He tried it again. So, so, so here I am. And there it is, he thought. For the first time since the crash, his mind started to work. His brain triggered and he began thinking. Here I am. Where is that? Where am I? He pulled himself once more up the bank to the tall tree without branches and sat again with his back against its rough bark. It was hot now, but the sun was high and to his rear, and he sat in the shade of the tree in relative comfort. There were things to sort out. Here I am, and that is nowhere. With his mind opened and thoughts happening, it all tried to come in with a rush, all of what had occurred, and he could not take it. The whole thing turned into a confused jumble that made no sense, so he fought it down and tried to take one thing at a time. He had been flying north to visit his father for a couple of months He did in the summer, and the pilot had had a heart attack and had died, and the plane had crashed somewhere in the Canadian North Woods, but he did not know how far they had flown or in what direction or where he was. Slow down, he thought. Slow down more. My name is Brian Robeson, and I am 13 years old, and I am alone in the North Woods of Canada. All right, he thought. That's simple enough. I was flying to visit my father, and the plane crashed and sank in a lake. There, keep it that way. Short thoughts. I do not know where I am, which doesn't mean much. More to the point, they do not know where I am. They, meaning anybody who might be wanting to look for me, the searchers. So here we're going to pause and ask another question that's going to help us come to an understanding for our guided question for the day, as well as um, the question you're going to have on Friday for the constructive response. So you'll notice that he slows himself down, right? He says, okay, slow down. So not only does he slow his thoughts down so that they're not racing and he's not overwhelmed with these thoughts, but he actually makes them short thoughts. He tells himself to have short thoughts and to slow them down. Why is he doing this? Why is he trying to make sure that his thoughts are short and slowed down? So take a minute to just, I'm going to ask the substitute, the guest teacher to pause this and discuss that question amongst yourselves. Okay, so I'm interested to see your answers from that question to maybe come back up later in your constructed response this week. So let's keep going. They would look for him, look for the plane. His father and mother would be frantic. They would tear the world apart to find him. Bride had seen searches on the news, seen movies about lost planes. When a plane went down, they mounted extensive searches, and almost always they found the plane within a day or two. Pilots all filed flight plans, a detailed plan for where and when they were going to fly, with all the courses explained. They would come. They would look for him. 
The searchers would get government planes and cover both sides of the flight plan filed by the pilot and search until they found him. Maybe even today. They might even come today. This was the second day after the crash. No, Brian frowned. Was it the first day or the second day? They had gone down in the afternoon, and he had spent the whole night out cold, so this was the first real day, but they could still come today. They would have started the search immediately when Brian's plane did not arrive. Yeah, they would probably come today. Probably come here with amphibious planes, small bush planes with floats that could land right here on the lake and pick him up and take him home. Which home? The father home or the mother home? He stopped the thinking. It doesn't matter. Either on to his dad or his or back to his mother. Either way, he would probably be home by late night or early morning. Home where he would sit down and eat a large, cheesy, juicy burger with tomatoes and double fries with ketchup and a thick chocolate shake. And there came the hunger. Brian rubbed his stomach. The hunger had been there, but something else, fear, pain, had held it down. Now, with the thought of the burger, the emptiness roared at him. He could not believe the hunger had never felt it this way. The lake water had filled his stomach but left him hungry, and now it demanded food, screamed for food. And there was, he thought, absolutely nothing to eat. Nothing. Okay, so now I want you guys to take a minute to answer this question. And when I finish posing the question, our guest teacher is gonna pause the video so that you guys can discuss it and then you guys can continue on from there. So here's my question. What are the primary conflicts that Brian is facing? And how is he responding to these conflicts, plural? Because there's definitely more than one happening. So what are these conflicts? And how is Brian responding to them? And you might even ask how the two conflicts are affecting each other. So how his focus from one conflict affects the other conflict. So if you'll pause the video now, I would love for you guys to discuss that. Okay, so what I'm hoping that you guys found is that Brian is very, his conflicts are conflicting him. So he is torn between focusing on these very basic physical needs, these external conflicts of, do I have food? Do I have water? Are my injuries treated? Um, are they gonna come rescue me? The things that would require him physically just for his body to be well. And as soon as he kind of gets the water in his system and that physical need is met, his mind is able to focus on the internal conflict and it goes back to the divorce, the big secret between his parents, which is, you know, it comes up with, well, when they do rescue me, whose home am I going to? Because this is a fresh divorce, okay? His parents have only been divorced for a month. So he, he doesn't really know how this works. And even so, this is a really atypical situation. But the only thing that pulls him away from that internal conflict is his stomach rumbling. So now that physical external need is pulling his focus away from that internal conflict and back to the external conflict because ultimately, this is what we call Maslow's hierarchy of needs, ultimately, your basic physical needs have to be met before you can ever think about anything beyond the physical, whether it's emotional or relational or what have you. So right now for him, for any human being, getting food in his stomach is going to matter more than what's going on with his parents. So you'll see this almost like tug of war between, like almost like Brian is in the middle and he is being tugged between these two conflicts. Like the conflicts are tugging at him. Do I focus on what I'm dealing with physically and try to resolve that issue? Or do I focus on what's happening emotionally and resolve that issue? So there's this kind of constant tug of war because he knows he has to resolve the conflict. That's the whole idea of plot. 
but which one does he focus on? Okay. So let's keep going. Um, we're on page 45 and we are about a third of the way down the page. And there was, he thought, absolutely nothing to eat. Nothing. What did they do in the movies when they got stranded like this? Oh yes, the hero usually found some kind of plant that he knew was good to eat and, take, and that took care of it. Just ate the plant until he was full or used some kind of cute trap to catch an animal and cook it over a slick little fire and pretty soon he had a full eight course meal. The trouble, Brian thought, looking around, was that all he could see was grass and brush. There was nothing obvious to eat, and aside from about a million birds and the beaver he hadn't seen animals to trap and cook, and even if he got one somehow, he didn't have any matches, so he couldn't have a fire. Nothing. It kept coming back to that. He had nothing. Well, almost nothing. As a matter of fact, he thought, I don't know what I've got or haven't got. Maybe I should try to figure out just how I stand. It will give me something to do, keep me from thinking of food until they come to find me. Brian had once had an English teacher, a guy named Perpich, who was always talking about being positive, thinking positive, staying on top of things. That's how Perpich had put it, stay positive and stay on top of things. Brian thought of him now, wondered how to stay positive and stay on top of this. All Perpich would say, is that I have to get motivated. He was always telling kids to get motivated. Brian changed position, so he was sitting on his knees. He reached into his pockets and took out everything he had and laid it on the grass in front of him. It was pitiful enough. A quarter, three dimes, a nickel, and two pennies. A fingernail clipper, a billfold with a $20 bill, in case you get stranded at the airport in some small town and have to buy food, his mother had said, and some odd pieces of paper. And on his belt, somehow still there, the hatchet his mother had given him. He had forgotten it, and now reached around and took it out and put it in the grass. There was a touch of rust already forming on the cutting edge of the blade, and he rubbed it off with his thumb. That was it. He frowned. No, wait. If he was going to play the game, might as well play it right. Perpich would tell him to quit messing around. Get motivated. Look at all of it, Robeson. He had on a pair of good tennis shoes, now almost dry, and socks, and jeans and underwear, and a thin leather belt and a t-shirt with a windbreaker so torn it hung on him in tatters. And a watch. He had a digital watch still on his wrist, but it was broken from the crash, the little screen blank, and he took it off and almost threw it away, but stopped the hand motion and laid the watch on the grass with the rest of it. There. That was it. No, wait. One more thing. Those were all the things he had, but he also had himself. Purpose used to drum that into them. You are your most valuable asset, don't forget that. You are the best thing that you have. Brian looked around again. I wish you were here, Perpich. I'm hungry and I'd trade everything I have for a hamburger. I'm hungry, he said it aloud. In normal tones at first, then louder and louder until he was yelling it. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. When he stopped, there was a sudden silence, not just from him, but the clicks and blurps and bird sounds of the forest as well. The noise of his voice had startled everything and it was quiet. He looked around, listened with his mouth open and realized that all his life, he had never heard silence before. Complete silence. That there had always been some sound some kind of sound. It lasted only a few seconds, but it was so intense that it seemed to become part of him. Nothing. There was no sound. Then the bird started again, and some kind of buzzing insect, and then a chattering and a cawing, and soon there was the same background of sound, which left him 
still hungry. Okay, so here I want, uh, when I finish this question, I want our guest teacher to hit pause again for you guys to talk about this. So when we are discussing plot, one of the main elements of plot, one of the main parts of plot is the setting. And setting is always crucial. It's always important. But in this particular story, it is especially so. So I want you to compare and contrast. So find similarities and differences in the setting that Brian is used to, where he comes from, what he's used to experiencing in that setting, and then find the similarities and differences with the setting he finds himself in now. Now that the plane has crashed in Canada, what are the similarities and differences between what he's used to and where he is now? So take a minute to discuss those things. Okay, so I'm going to offer up a follow-up question to that that we might not have the answer to yet, but I want you to think about it. Feel free to go ahead and pause when I'm done with this to talk about it for about 30 seconds or so. But now that you've discussed the contrast, and hopefully what you realized is he's used to city life. He's used to the hustle and bustle. He's used to the noise. He's used to all the resources being right there. Oh, you're hungry? Let's go to the grocery store. Let's go to the local fast food place. And he's used to having all those necessities just right there and accessible for him. Whereas where he finds him now in the wilderness is so remote, is so isolated, that he's realizing he's never really heard silence before. That there's always been noise and disruption and distraction where he's from. And for the first time, he actually hears silence, but also because of the silence, he's able to hear specific sounds of specific animals. But also, that food is not readily available. So the things that were prepared for him when he was in the city, the conveniences of modern life and of city life, are not there for him now. So this leads me to that follow-up question, okay? Which is, how is this change in setting affecting Brian? You might think conflict, in terms of conflict. How is this change of setting affecting or creating conflict for Brian. So take about 30 seconds to discuss that and then we'll move on from there. Okay, um, I don't really wanna go into too much discussion on that one just because I want, I want us to develop the answer. There's more, it builds as we keep reading and I wanna develop that. But I do have one more question on the passage that we've just read before we continue which is as he is overwhelmed by the, the nothing, right? The nothing. He is surrounded by nothing, which can be this feeling of absolute hopelessness and despair. I have nothing. I'm helpless. I'm hopeless. He starts cataloging the things he does have, okay? So I want you as a class to take a minute or two to discuss what items he lists off, what are the items he catalogs that he actually has, by the way, if you have your own copy of the book, this would be a good time to be highlighting and underlining any of the things that he lists or catalogs, okay? So I want you to, to take note of those things that he realizes he does have, instead of talking about just nothing, having nothing. But I also want you to talk about how this catalog that he comes up with after feeling this nothingness how it connects to growth mindset versus fixed mindset. Okay, so take a minute or two to discuss that and then we will pick back up. Okay, so we're gonna continue on page 48. Um, and I hope what you guys came to the realization with in that last question and that last discussion is when he was cataloging he was remembering the words of his English teacher that probably at the time he rolled his eyes about. Like, in all honesty, at that time, he was probably like, yeah, yeah, Mr. Purpich, you're lecturing me. I'm tired of it. But in this moment, that's what he's drawing on. He's pulling that information. He's pulling that knowledge, and he really wants to keep a hold of that. And that's what he's utilizing to get him through this time. So with that catalog... What seems to be the most important thing 
that he counters as the opposite of nothing, right? So he's trying to tell himself, not only do I not have nothing, but here are the things that I have. The most valuable thing he had, and I hope you guys caught on to this with your discussion, is himself. That is the most valuable asset he has. So he goes from the state of hopelessness, of despair, of feeling nothing, of feeling empty, to recognizing not only what he does have to work with, but to recognize the value of himself in this scenario. So I'm hoping that you guys picked up on that. So we're going to continue on page 48 with the, um, it would technically be the third full paragraph, even though the second full paragraph is only one sentence. So, of course, he thought, putting the coins and the rest back in his pocket and the hatchet in his belt. Of course, if they came tonight, or even if they take as long as tomorrow, the hunger is no big thing. People have gone for many days without food as long as they've got water. Even if they don't come until late tomorrow, I'll be all right. Lose a little weight, maybe, but the first hamburger and a malt and fries will bring it right back. A mental picture of hamburger, the way they showed it on the television commercials, thundered into his thoughts. Rich colors, the meat juicy and hot. He pushed the picture away. So even if they didn't find him until tomorrow, he thought, he would be all right. He had plenty of water, although he wasn't sure if it was good and, and clean or not. He sat again by the tree, his back against it. There was a thing bothering him. He wasn't quite sure what it was, but it kept chewing at the edge of his thoughts. Something about the plane and the pilot that would change things. Ah, there it was. The moment when the pilot had his heart attack, his right foot had jerked down on the rudder pedal and the plane had slewed sideways. What did that mean? Why did that keep coming into his thinking that way, nudging and pushing? It means, a voice in his thoughts said, that they might not be coming for you tonight or even tomorrow. When the pilot pushed the rudder pedal, the plane had jerked to the side and assumed a new course. Brian could not remember how much it had pulled around, but it wouldn't have, to have, it wouldn't have had to be much because after that, with the pilot dead, Brian had flowed for hour after hour on the new course. Well away from the flight plan, the pilot had filed many hours and maybe 160 miles an hour. Even if it was only a little off course, with that speed and time, Brian might now be sitting several hundred miles off to the side of the recorded flight plan. And they would probably search most heavily at first along the flight plan course. They might go out to the side a little, but he could easily be three, four hundred miles to the side he could not know, could not think of how far he might have flown wrong because he didn't know the original course and didn't know how much they had pulled sideways. Quite a bit. That's how he remembered it. Quite a jerk to the side. It pulled his head over sharply when the plane had swung around. They might not find him for two or three days. He felt his heartbeat increase as the fear started. The thought was there, but he fought it down for a, for a time, pushed it away, and then it exploded out. They might not find him for a long time. And the next thought was there as well, that they might never find him. But that was panic, and he fought it down and tried to stay positive. They searched hard when a plane went down. They used many men in planes and they would go to the side and they would know he was off from the flight plan. He had talked to the man on the radio. They would somehow know. It would be all right. They would soon find him. Maybe not tomorrow, but soon. 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 They would find him soon. Gradually, like sloshing oil, his thoughts settled back and the panic was gone. Say they didn't come for two days. No, say they didn't come for three days. Even push that to four days. He could live with that. He would have to live with that. He didn't want to think of them taking longer, but say four days. He had to do something. He couldn't just sit at the bottom of this tree and stare down at the lake for four days and nights. 
He was in deep woods and didn't have any matches, couldn't make a fire. There were large things in the woods. There were wolves, he thought, and bears, other things. In the dark, he would be in the open here, just sitting at the bottom of a tree. He looked around suddenly, felt the hair on the back of his neck go up. Things might be looking at him right now, waiting for him, waiting for dark so they could move in and take him. He fingered the hatchet at his belt. It was the only weapon he had, but it was something. He had to have some kind of shelter. No, make that more. He had to have some kind of shelter, and he had to have something to eat. He pulled himself to his feet and jerked the back of his shirt down before the mosquitoes could get at it. He had to do something to help himself. I have to get motivated, he thought, remembering Perpich. Right now, I'm all I've got. I have to do something.